So I'm Dan York and I'm here at IETF 86 in Orlando with Emila Volk, who's the project lead for the Jitsi soft phone project. So um, maybe tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Jitsi and voice over IP and those kind of things. Well, uh, I've always been interested in VoIP. It was, I've always found it so cool. I was, even when I was a kid, I was playing with the walkie-talkies all the time. And then it just seemed natural that uh, I'd be interested in doing the same thing over IP. Uh, and Jitsi really started a long time ago. It's actually been more than 10 years now. Uh, in the beginning, it was a very simple project. It was an audio video SIP phone that just did that. And uh, it was a prototype. Uh, people used it for uh, its IPv6 capabilities just to do testing. And uh, we've then decided to turn it into a real phone uh, that, that, that real people can use, not just uh, IT professionals. And we added instant messaging, we added security, we added conferencing, and that's how we got where we are today. So you mentioned IPv6, and you were early on with IPv6. How did that come about? We were. Actually, the, one of the reasons that Jitsi was born, it was called SIP Communicator back then, was IPv6. I was at the University of Strasbourg back then doing my master's degree, and um, there was that network research team which was working on IPv6 a lot, and uh, they were basically doing a whole bunch of projects. Hey, let's do that thing over IPv6 and that other thing, so a bunch of other... Uh, they were adding IPv6 support to a number of other projects, and then they said, can we just add IPv6 support to some SIP stack? Uh, and we did. We did that with the NIST SIP. Uh, today it's JSIP stack. We added IPv6. And then when we did that, um, I was thinking, can we... Uh, let, let's do an example uh, how you can use that stack to, to build a, a phone. So we added an examples directory in the stack, and that's where SIP Communicator was born. And it kept growing and growing, and at some point it, 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 it became <laughs> two times bigger than the stack. And, and the people from JSIP, who are great friends, they said, mm, don't you want to move that project somewhere else because it's, uh, uh, it, 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 it's beginning to take too much space. That's, that's when we moved it in a... Um, too much uh, space in the examples directory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The examples directory were like two times bigger than, uh, than the actual project. And that's where SIP Communicator was born. And again, people were using it a lot for its IPv6 capabilities. Uh, if you wanted to test IPv6, there weren't, a whole, there weren't many ways to do it. Uh, and and Jitsi, SIP Communicator was, was one of them. Interesting. Now, when you added IPv6 support to it, I mean, was there anything? Well, I guess it came up out of the IPv6 stack, right? Yeah. yeah. So it, it was born. It was native IPv6. It was, really. it was born with IPv6, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, you, yeah, you're the opposite case. Some people are looking at how they add IPv6 support yeah. to the applications, but you were already there. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was a focus from the start. Well, we've broken IPv6 several times throughout the history of the project, obviously. Uh, but it's never been that hard to fix it and uh, that's why we, we keep having it and we one of the continuing efforts is to make it as transparent as possible uh, and and one of the tricky parts is always knowing whether you pick IPv6 or IPv4 yeah yeah I was going to ask you about that so how do you I mean you know we've got happy eyeballs in, in uh, yeah. browsers and things how do you deal with that well um, we have a bunch of different heuristics. Uh, first of all, whenever you you use ICE, uh, the interactive, interactive Connectivity Establishment Protocol, obviously you have not a problem because just you try whatever you have and if IPv6 works, then you go with that. Um, if not, then we try to um, we try to, to see what we're using for our signaling connection. If we're connected to our SIP server with IPv6, this is what we're going to offer by default to, to anyone who, who we are talking to. Uh, and if not, we try to see what the, if, if we are called by someone, if they use IPv6, we use IPv6. Uh, and if we're not sure, uh, we use IPv4 so far. Obviously, the best thing would be to just uh, have ice everywhere and uh, try whatever we can. and. Uh, and, and in that case, IPv6 would be the preferred choice every time. Interesting. Now, uh, to move to another topic, uh, about a year ago, you, you folks uh, added DNSSEC support. I know you're doing some stuff with the NLNet Foundation and stuff. So, what did um, talk a little bit about what IP, DNSSEC adds to the uh, to the VoIP connections? Yeah, uh, indeed we did, and I'd like to start by expressing uh, our gratitude to the NLNet Foundation for funding the project, uh, to Ingo Bauer's acts. Um, for uh, and the university he's at for uh, for actually working in it and integrating it with GT. That was uh, that was a substantial effort. So thanks, uh, thanks, Ingo. Thanks, Anonet. And um, so the 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 problem with um, the problem with DNS in general is that you never really know uh, who uh, who you are connecting 
who you're connecting to. Basically, when you connect to a SIP server, you don't, you don't really know if this is the exact SIP server that you want it to connect to. Uh, and the only way to go uh, about resolving that issue without the NSSEC is just making sure that um, every SIP server in an infrastructure is going to have um, a certificate that um, asserts it as the right SIP server for, a particular, for the domain that you wanted to connect to in the first place. But this might be a deployment hassle. You, you cannot necessarily have that uh, top-level domain certificate at all, at all of your SIP hosts. So um, with DNSSEC, uh, you can, for example, um, uh, start looking for the SIP server for the itf.org domain and then you end up at some machine at an, ID, at an Amazon, Amazon cloud that has a certificate for that specific machine. If you use DNSSEC, that would be okay and it's very easy to deploy and you ha have uh, uh, you, you have that extra security with uh, with an easy deployment with less... It, it actually reduces your deployment effort. That's, uh, if I have to summarize it, that's, I think, mm -hmm. the biggest advantage. Really, yeah, right, because you've got the, uh, you, you know from the DNSSEC, from the records that are in, the, in, in DNS, that this is, in fact, the correct it, Exactly, the because when you, let's say that when I configure my client, and I just say, I want to connect to my ITF org SIP server, and um, when I start doing that, because of load balancing, uh, because of reliability, people would maybe forward me through a bunch of different records. I would start by asking for, my, for the NAPTO records, I would then ask for SRV records, I would then ask for uh, Quad A or A records, and every time uh, I may be forwarded, forwarded to different domains, to different machines, to, uh, a bunch, to, to clusters, and um, so I have followed a path from the NAPTO through the SRV to the Quad A, uh, and every time I have been asking someone, where, where do I go next, where do I go next? And um, if I don't trust that path, uh, then I have a problem because I end up at a machine that accepts my username and password, but I, uh, I, I, I no longer know if this is really where I wanted to go in the first place. Right, right, interesting. So yeah, so DNSSEC is ensuring that you're getting all the correct records yes. you need in that whole SIP exchange to yes. wind up having that kind of connection. Well, yes, and if I don't actually, then I'm exposed to a whole, to a whole bunch of different issues. Basically, uh, I'm connected to a SIP server that I'm, I don't necessarily trust. That SIP server can put itself in the media path of all my conversations, it, it, it could potentially eavesdrop on some, uh, on some of them. Now, we do also have uh, encryption protocols that are end-to-end -end and that, uh, like CRDP for example, uh, that would still give you uh, the security for the actual call if you use it, but um, the server could prevent you from using CRDP. So you would know that you don't have security, but many users would could become careless at that point and, and say, well, I don't have encryption, but uh, well, anyway, I'm just going to say what I have to, uh, and and then they might realize that this was a problem. And even if you do have ZRDP, uh, if you're connected to the wrong SIP server, you can still, um, you are still exposing data that you potentially don't want to expose, like who am I calling? Uh, how often do I call them? Right. Uh, this is private data that ZRDP is not protecting because it's part of signaling, and in many cases you wouldn't that, you wouldn't want that to be known. Cool. That's great. Well, so, so where could people, if they want to try out Jitsi, where can they get it? Well, uh, they can go to jitsi.org, J-I-T-S-I.org. Uh, you can download it. We're always uh, on the lookout for contributors. There are many things you can do, even if you're not a programmer. You can do video screencasts explaining how you do certain things, uh, video conferences or, uh, or whatever. And of course, we're always on the lookout for developers as well. So uh, if you have uh, free time and looking for um, a worthwhile initiative to join, you would be welcome at Jitsi. All right, thank you. I've been thank talking you, with uh, Emile Levold, the project lead for the Jitsi project. Thank you. Thanks.